Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Aisha. I'm one of the PGY3s. I'm just going to be helping moderate Grand Rounds today. We have a great lineup with our Glaucoma Fellow and um, our past fellows here. First up, we have Megan. She's going to be talking about innovation in glaucoma. She hails to us from Denver, Colorado, and we have great fun facts today. Hers is um, she had a run in with uh, our particular 007 in a little town called Langley. Welcome, Megan. Hey, good morning. My name is Megan. I am one of the Glaucoma Research Fellows here at the Moran. Um, yes, I did get to meet 007, also known as Daniel Craig in real life, uh, when I interned at the CIA uh, during college. It was definitely a very unique experience meeting James Bond at the CIA. So today I'd like to talk about innovation in glaucoma. Um, this past weekend, we actually held our first Moran Interventional Glaucoma course right here um, in Salt Lake City. And so we were able to talk a about a lot of different um, innovation that we've seen in the clinic, in the OR, um, over the past few years in glaucoma. And so today, I'd like to not only expand on what we've already seen in glaucoma innovation, but also talk about what's on the horizon and what we're doing here at the Cranial Center to um, invent new things. So I'd like to start by talking about what innovation even is. Innovation is seeing what everybody has seen and thinking what nobody has thought. And I think these words really emphasize the importance of thinking outside of the box and challenging the status quo in order to come up with new solutions for our patients. And we've seen this throughout the history of ophthalmology. Dr. Ridley was the first to implant an intraocular lens in 1949, and he challenged the notion that a fake was the best possible visual, visual outcome after cataract surgery. Dr. Kel Kelman invented phacal emulsification in 1967. He actually came up with this idea after visiting a dentist's office, and he saw ultrasound technology being used to remove plaque from a tooth. And so now phacal emulsification is actually one of the most widely used innovations in ophthalmology. So to me, innovation is really exciting. And so I went to the University of Miami for medical school, where I was able to explore a lot of these different projects and in innovation, particularly in glaucoma. So one project that I worked on was revolving a virtual reality visual field device and implementing the Esterman visual field test on this. So the Esterman test uh, looks for visual field deficits and is a lot of times used in order to obtain a driver's license in a lot of states. And so the test that we did was one of the first to implement the Esterman visual field test using a virtual reality visual field headset. And we think that with further testing, this can really become a convenient and portable method to implement the test. And I think this was one of the first projects that I was involved in where I saw how innovation screening can really be used to expand care for those who may not be able to act, easily access it. And so at, the, at Miami, I was an MD MPH student. And so I wanted to see how we could bring innovation and screening globally. For my capstone project, I particularly focused on pediatric vision screenings in the Caribbean. And so we worked with these different Caribbean clinics to um, increase access to innovative screening tools and also increase the education on the screen screening process and why it's important to screen children to prevent amblyopia. I was also interested in understanding innovation monitoring. We've seen throughout the literature that eye care home tonometry has been useful in the management of adult glaucoma and it's actually also been shown to be useful in kids as well. So here, one of my projects was looking at post-operative IOP variability um, in pediatric glaucoma. This was one of the patients I had in Miami, and she actually didn't live in Miami. She was also from the Caribbean. So we were able to monitor her um, IOP variability after OD barbell glaucoma implant. And you can see there's a very significant uh, decrease in her IOP variability following surgery, which we presented at the UK Pediatric Glaucoma Society Conference of 2022. So I truly could not have been more excited to come to the Crandall Center this year and um, not only expand on my interest that I had already developed in Miami, focusing on virtual reality screening and eye care home tonometry, but also understand innovation surgery. And so here at the Crandall Center, we've been doing a lot of unique projects regarding um, innovations in surgery. And so today I'd like to share three of those with you. The first is eczema laser trabeculostomy or ELT. And this is a laser that creates microchannels through the trabecular meshwork in the inner wall of Schlem's, Schlem's canal. What's particularly unique about this laser is that it is non-thermal. And so this works through a process called cold ablation. Essentially, this means that it will target the, uh, the TM without, with, while minimizing damage to surrounding structures. So ELT was actually developed in 1987 by Dr. Michael Berlin as actually one of the first microinvasive glaucoma surgery procedures. Essentially, this is an abenternal procedure that targets the TM. 
But at the time that it was developed, Advent turnoff procedures like MIGs weren't actually that popular. And if there were laser procedures going on, they were typically um, things like SLT or ALT. But with the rise of MIGs in the past decade or two, um, ELT has been on the rise as well, and so has research in this field. So here's a video by Dr. Ahmed showing how ELT is performed. You can see here that um, there's a corneal incision made, and then under gonioscopic vis visualization, the uh, laser probe will touch the TM. Then a foot pedal is depressed for about two seconds, firing off that laser. Um, the laser is a 308 nanometer xenon chloride extramer laser. Typically, 10 microchannels will be made, and they're about one to the diameter apart. So here at the Cranial Center, we've partnered with Elios, which is a company that has made an ELT device. And actually, their ELT device is already approved in the EU and Switzerland. It's been approved since 1998. But here in the US, we're still actually undergoing FDA um, approval. And so what we did with Elios is we wanted to study how exactly these channels present in the human eye. So for instance, do they target through the whole TM? Do they only penetrate, penetrate through part of it? Um, do they indent lens canal at all? And so these are questions that we wanted to explore in this study. So what we did here is we took four cadaveric eyes from two donors at the um, from the Utah Lions at Eye, Eye Bank. And Dr. Ahmed performed the ELT at various probe depths from zero to 300 microns. Um, to see if that probe depth would impact the channel morphology at all. He also performed dual goniotomy and 360 GAT, and these were used as morphologic comparisons. So what we found is that there was actually no significant changes in terms of channel length, width, or depth, even at those various probe depths. And essentially what this means is that the channel consistency remained, the channel morphology remained fairly consistent over various probe depths. We also found that those channels were mushroom shaped. And essentially this could be attributable to a phenomenon called the plume phenomenon. This is when the laser emits a vapor bubble that will expand initially and then collapses. And when it collapses, it's going to carry away that excess thermal energy um, from that side of ablation. And this is what causes ELT to be what it is, which is cold ablation. And you can see that mushroom shape is kind of demonstrated here. And finally, the ELT channels didn't seem to indent, indent Schlem's canal at all, even at that greatest probe depth of 300 microns. Here's some pictures that we had of scanning electron microscopy. Um, you can see there's very little re residual damage um, in the ELT picture as compared to dual bait goniotomy and 360 GAT. So overall, what the study showed us is that ELT may be a great option when we want to ensure consistency of channels in terms of their morphology, even at different um, usages of the probe in terms of how deep one uses the probe. This, along with the fact that the greatest probe deaths didn't actually indent Schlem's canal at all, seems to suggest that ELT may be uh, safe to test clinically. So next, I'd like to talk about glaucoma drainage devices, and particularly if we can make one with a material called EPTFE. Glaucoma drainage devices have been on the rise in recent decades. Um, one study actually showed a 410% increase in tube shunts and a 72% decrease in trabeculectomies. And so we've seen it's really popular in recent years, but a major cause of failure is fibrosis. Almost 40% of tube shunts will fail in five years. And here you can see that Kaplan-Meier um, failure analysis, which shows that failure rate over those five years. So this study, which was made done in 2022, also, also found a few potential causes of tube failure. One was preoperative IOP over 21, another was having neovascular glaucoma, and another one was increased age. But what about the device material? Could the, the material of the device itself also contribute to fibrosis? And so this was something we wanted to study in this um, test here. And we particularly looked at a material called EPTFE. EPTFE was invented in the 1960s by R.W. Gore, and it's been seen as Gore-Tex. So you may have seen this in shoes and rain jackets, it's actually also used in um, medical devices as well, from vascular grafts and stents. And what makes this device, uh, this material unique is that it has unique tensile strength, thermal stability, and hydrophobicity. And so if it's already being used in the medical field, can we use this in the eye, particularly as a glaucoma drainage device? Most glaucoma drainage devices are comprised of a silicone su surface, but EPTFE is a biocompatible material with a highly adaptable structure. And so for this reason, it could be a really good alternative to silicone for tube shunts. 
So here at the Crandall Center, we partnered with Gore to see if by allowing for better cellular integration, um, a subconjunctival EPTFE implant could reduce fibrosis while still maintaining that tissue porosity. So we decided to test our study question on our Moran rabbits here at the Cradle Center. Um, Dr. Fitz has actually done a good amount of these rabbit studies at Wilmer, and so we've been really excited to have him join us here, um, as well as Gore, to test that out here in Moran. So what we did here is we had nine uh, New Zealand rabbits, and so Dr. Nakatsuka implanted the EPTFE device in these 18 eyes. And you can see how that would probably present here in this image on the right. We particularly monitored the rabbits for one month post-operatively, looking to see if there was any notable slit lamp findings, any adverse events that happened, and making sure that that blood was still intact. We also performed histopathology with Dr. Mannless and Dr. Werner to assess for good cellular integration and just to make sure that there was no signs of fibrosis and minimal uh, inflammation as well. So here are some pictures from one of our rabbits. You can see on the left there's post-op week one, and on the right there's post-op month one. So at post-op week one, we see some limbal and some iris vascularity, um, but no real adverse, were noted, adverse events were noted in this rabbit. On the right, there's post-op month one. And this, uh, at this point, we actually did flow testing as well, just to make sure that the channel was still patent. And so you can see here that this uh, nicely demonstrates that blub as well. Here were some of our histopathology results. On the left is an h &E image at 2x magnification, and this shows a good cross-section of that device. On the right, there's a trichome image at 20x magnification, and this shows the cellular integration. So you can see those cells are well incorporated into that device there. Overall, the devices really only had rare instances of fibrosis and inflammation, and gener generally they were well tolerated by our rabbits. So overall, the study showed us how EPTFE may be a good material to use to minimize fibrosis as a glaucoma drainage device. We actually also have another preclinical trial underway right now with Gore. Um, it should be about six months, and so I think this will give us a lot more data in terms of how these devices present in the rabbits long term, um, wh whether there are any signs of inflammation or fibrosis, and hopefully we will be able to reach clinical trials in the future. So finally, I'd like to talk about advancements in creating a glaucoma implant where you can open and close shunts to titrate IOP, so essentially a titratable glaucoma implant. So following traditional glaucoma surgery, like a tube or a trap, IOP may fluctuate around um, the target IOP. And there may be ways the surgeon may want to alter the IOP um, through things like a trabeculectomy suture release, but these techniques may lack predictability and often aren't really that reversible. And so what we did here at the Cranial Center is we worked with MyRevision to see if we could test a titratable glaucoma implant. And this um, was called the Caliber Eye. So the Caliber Eye is a microinvasive blood surgery or MIBS procedure. Essentially MIBS is like traditional glaucoma surgery by creating a filtering blood um, that shunts aqueous humor from the anterior chamber to the subconjunctival space, but uses a much smaller incision. And so this device here is made of nickel titanium alloy and medical grade silicone. And what makes this device particularly unique is that you can titrate IOP. So you have one open channel there in the middle, and then you have two valve control channels on either side of it. These two channels on either side can be controlled with a transcorneal laser, and those can be open and closed with that laser. So here are the different channels. There's a standard channel in, that, in the middle, and that's what remains open. And then the medium channel and the large channel are what can be controlled and altered. Here are the four different channel settings. So there's a baseline setting, and this is when only that standard channel is open. There is a moderate setting when you then also open that medium channel. So now you have the standard channel and that medium channel, which you open with that laser. You have a high set, uh, setting, which is when you have that standard and the large channel. And then there's also a maximal setting, which is when all three channels are open. And what's interesting about Caliber Eye is that if you open a, a channel, you can actually close it later with that same laser. So here is a video showing how that device is inserted. So initially there's an incision with the keratone blade. And then the device is inserted into the anterior chamber. And you can see that right there, those are the where you can control with the laser. And then eventually it's tied down and secured. 
Here is how that would look under UVM. You can see again that that um, plate sits really nicely in the anterior chamber. And here on the right, you can see how those laser settings would actually work. So here is that laser plate again. And so here right now that switch is off on the right side and then a laser is used to switch that on. So now that second channel is open and that's gonna raise the blood. And here you can actually also turn off that channel if you want. So now it's closed and the blood is going to be reduced. Same thing on the other side with that large channel. And then you can close that one as well. So here at Moran, we've actually done three RAVA studies with my revision over the past few years. Dr. Nakatsuka and Dr. Ahmed have implanted about 12 devices in each of these three studies. And here you can see how the caliber eye may present in a rabbit. Now my revision is actually currently conducting clinical trials. So they're doing um, easy early feasibility studies abroad, and they're actually preparing for their first one here in the US soon. We think that following these clinical trials, a titratable glaucoma implant may be available in the near future for moderate to severe glaucoma patients. So I'd like to thank all my mentors for their help on this project. Dr. Nakatsuka for all of his guidance throughout this project and throughout all my research. Dr. Ahmed and Dr. Pitha for spearheading the Crandall Center and um, allowing me to join all these very exciting projects. Dr. Manlis and Dr. Werner for their help with histopathology. Evan for his help in the uh, glaucoma research lab the glaucoma department, and the marine community for truly making me feel at home since the day I arrived here in Salt Lake City. And thank you so much. Happy to take any questions. Um, but one um, issue I think that would be interesting to see what comes out of the caliber eye is just Calibri, yeah, caliber eye. Um, is that it, it's kind of big in the AC, and I'd be worried about in the field cell loss, mm -hmm. something like that. So it'll be interesting to see how because there's going to be some with that large of a device to move out into the AC. Yeah, I think that's yeah, that's definitely good to notice, especially after what we've seen with the side pass, just ensuring that there's no um, endothelial cell loss with these new MIGs or MIBS devices. So. That was definitely a concern I had in the beginning. Um, is just anything in the AC, you know, is a concern for the cell so on. Um, and um, but the thing is, you know, if you compare it to a tube, it's not all that different in terms of sizing uh, and, and what a tube would do to the molecular uh, cells as well. Now, if you compare it to the Zen, that might be a little bit different. So it'd be interesting to look at sort of comparisons. Uh, comparisons. Kind of cross it between all of them. There's always a balance between. A device that's just cool. I mean, that's really cool, right? You could use a laser to tap it. It's got to be big enough so that you've got a target you can actually see in the adult, but not so large an endothelial problem. But I think in all of these the clinical trials, are going to have to follow specular microscopy very, very carefully because we've learned that we certainly had devices in the past that we really thought were looking pretty good and it ended up over time not being good. It, it's a very, very slow erosion, increased erosion of the corneal endothelial cells adds up rapidly over time. All right, thank you so much. Next up, we have Melissa, one of our PATH fellows. Uh, she grew up in the Bay Area, and it's very interesting that Megan mentioned so many rabbits because Melissa's fun fact is that she is the first PATH fellow in 30 years to be bitten by one of those lab rabbit rabbits. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Melissa, and I am one of the ocular pathology and research fellows. Um, yes, you know, Dr. Werner and Dr. Manlis told me that no one has ever been bitten, and so I let my guard down. I was uh, petting one of the rabbits because I needed to check um, her IOP, and then she sniffed my hand and bit it. <laughs> um, so today I will pre be presenting on a severe intraocular lens tilt following the Yamani technique. 
I wanted to start off by introducing my mentors, Dr. Mamlis and Dr. Werner, um, and a little bit about the work that we do in our lab. They are truly the pioneers, the experts in intraocular lens biocompatibility research, both in vivo and in vitro, as well as a whole host of other research topics, which are listed underneath their pictures right there. Um, I've been here at Utah in, I've been here at the U and at Moran for the last five months, and I really um, couldn't have landed at a better institution. I am so grateful for their mentorship as well as everyone else's in our lab. I have no financial disclosures. Okay, so I wanted to start off with a question. What do these have in common? <laughs> this being a three-piece IOL, and this being a nicely charred rotating piece of chicken. If you said rotisserie effect, you'd be correct. Um, to give you a little bit context about the lens in this picture, this is the Zeiss CT Lucia 602 lens. It is the three-piece hydrophobic acrylic lens with PVDF modified C haptics. It has an optic diameter of six millimeters, a total diameter of 13 millimeters, and a five degree haptic angulation. This is the preferred IOL for the Yamani technique, which is one um, using intrascleral fixation. I also wanted to note that this is actually an off-label use for this lens in that this lens was neither designed nor marketed for the Yamani technique. To give you a little bit of background on the Yamani technique, um, this was developed by Dr. Shin Yamani in 2017, and this is used for cases lacking capsular support. So in the case of a non-intact capsular bag or um, perhaps weak zonules leading to dislocation. Um, this involves scleral fixation with a double needle technique um, to thread that haptic end through the needle to uh, through and then through the scleral tunnel. Um, there are multiple advantages for using the Yamani technique. Um, this involves a smaller incision. It does not require a conjunctival pyridomy, and it usually involves a shorter operating time. There's also a lower risk of post-operative hypotony when we compare it to larger scleral fixation methods. Um, here on the right, we have a screenshot from, I believe, one of Dr. Nakatsuka's cases where he uses the Yamani technique um, in order to um, achieve secondary IOL fixation. Um, this case is a little bit more complicated because of that large iris defect that you see there on the right, um, but I think it really shows nicely uh, the haptic there coming across and then ending up outside of the eye. So this, um, I wanted to present to you to give you a little bit more detail about the steps of the Yamani technique. Again, this is a case um, from Dr. Nakasuka. Um, this is this patient was found to have a strangely dislocated intraocular lens, um, and they were then found to have dead bag syndrome, which is when there's no proliferative cortical material in the bag holding the lens in place, and the zonules uh, appear to be weakened. Um, so. In this first screenshot, um, hopefully you can see the 30 gauge needle here, which is creating that scleral tunnel. In this second screenshot, um, Dr. Nakasuka is using his intraocular forceps to thread the end of the needle into the, or thread the end of the haptic into the lumen of the needle. Um, he then externalizes the needle, pulling the haptic with it. And then he uses this cautery to create a mushroom-shaped uh, bulb to prevent the haptic from slipping back inside of the eye. So why am I talking about this lens and why am I talking about this technique? Well, in the last several years, there have been reported cases here at the Moran exhibiting something called severe optic tilt. Um, this was found to be both spontaneous and also it occurred rather quickly after surgery, often on post-op day one. Um, when I first learned about this, I thought, oh, maybe it's rotating at the junction between the um, sclera and the haptic end. But in all of the cases that, that proved to be not true, um, the haptic end was actually fixed pretty appropriately within the sclera. 
Instead, it was noted that the haptics were loose within the optic haptic junction, um, rotating easily, and that's why we call this the road the rotisserie effect. Um, we saw many of these cases in the second half of 2022 and onward. Um, here, I believe this is another picture by Dr. Nakatsuka. Um, he utilized Tripan Blue intraoperatively, and hopefully you can see here the edge of the optic facing us, which means that this IOL has rotated about 90 degrees. It's almost like a coin that whose edge is um, facing toward you. And so we took these 13 cases, um, we had 13 explanted intraocular lenses, and we created this table to kind of document all of the characteristics associated with these lenses. Um, some of these variables include um, the duration of implanted uh, IOL in days, um, the reason for explantation, um, as well as associated general medical conditions and ocular comorbidities. Um, we were also really lucky to be able to document 12 out of the 13, in 12 out of the 13 cases, the serial numbers for those specific intraocular lenses. Um, I wanted to note that case three um, seen right here was not done via the Yamani technique, but actually an iris fixation technique. Um, we wanted to include this in our study because we wanted to assess the haptic status um, and we wanted to look at possible rotation. Um, for that patient, it was noted that they had UGG syndrome or uveitis glaucoma hyphema syndrome. Um, something that we noticed was that the reason for explantation in all 13 cases was that the IOL itself was uh, dislocated and decentered. Um, but we noticed that in cases 5 through 13, that there was an additional diagnosis of intraocular uh, lens optic tilt. And so Going a little bit more into that, we wanted to see how many days that this intraocular lens was in the eye. And so what we found, interestingly enough, was that in cases 5 through 13, which are lenses explanted after November of 2022, um, that the average number of days was about 80, 80 days. But if we compare that if we compare that to cases one through four, we see that the average number of days um, that the IOL is in the eye is 600 days, so quite a difference. We were also interested in seeing how many days after surgery was this severe optic tilt noticed. We had two cases that we didn't have sufficient information, but the majority of cases, um, the surgeon noted severe optic tilt in on post-op day one or intraoperatively in case six. And so the average number of days was a little bit less than three weeks or 18 days. As we were putting the study together, I found the comments from the post-surgical um, progress notes really interesting. So I wanted to highlight those here. One surgeon noted IOL completely perpendicular to cornea. Another noted there was considerable tilt in the intraocular lens. In another case, one patient was perceptive enough to notice his own optic tilt. And the progress note reads, the patient is concerned the lens may be tilted because if he pushes on the, his eye in a certain way, his vision improves. And lastly, when we had multiple cases and this pattern arising, um, one surgeon said, IOL completely tilted, known manufacturing problem. And so in our lab, what we wanted to do is we wanted to document the status of the haptics, and we wanted to verify this presence of the rotisserie effect. So how we um, documented the haptic status is we came up with this algorithm. We separated the haptics into attached and detached. If they were attached, then we would further categorize them into broken, deformed, and unremarkable. If the haptics happened to be deformed, then they would be further categorized into stretched and distorted or a combination of the both. 
Um, here's a summary of all of our results uh, for the haptic status and the rotation assessment. I'll be going over this um, table in detail in the following slides. In terms of haptic status, we had 24 attached haptics, six were broken, 15 were deformed, and three were unremarkable. Out of those haptics that were deformed, about equal amounts were stretched, distorted, and both stretched and distorted. Um, I love showing this picture because it's a really beautiful collage of all of our explanted intraocular lenses. Um, these in the with the yellow star were done by Dr. Nakatsuka. Um, these were done by other surgeons here at the Moran and elsewhere. And then these with the red stars are our control lenses. Um, again, all cases had this this um, diagnosis of dislocation decentration as the indication for the explantation surgery, but only cases five through 13 um, had this extra indication of severe optic tilt. I wanted to show you this slide because when we're documenting haptic status, um, if I give you this slide here, it might not be very clear um, what the, whether or not the haptics are deformed. But if I give you this view, which is the side perspective, then you can really see that deformation with that this haptic here. And so this is actually case eight, which if you look right here, to me, that looks pretty okay. But when we see this in the side view, then you can really see that deformation. So I wanted to note that we looked at um, haptic status in three different views, anterior, posterior, and side views. Um, and that the assessment was made um, with three researchers, and then they agreed on the assessment at the end. And so the second objective we had in our study was to verify the presence of the rotisserie effect. We did this by using forceps to rotate that haptic within its optic-haptic junction. And then to mimic the IOL in the human eye, we placed the intraocular lenses in BSS and then in the oven at 37 degrees Celsius for about a week. We then took these lenses out of the oven and reassessed for rotation. What we found was that at room temperature, there was no rotation of any of the haptics. But at body temperature, we found four of the haptics uh, having free rotation. Um, I wanted to note that the haptics only rotated in the second um, group, the group uh, groups, the second group in which cases five through 13 were a part of. Um, remember, this is the group where there was severe optic tilt. You might be wondering, why didn't we see free rotation in all the other haptics? Um, some of the theories we've come up with are perhaps we didn't use enough force during our rotation assessment, or maybe there during explantation, there were um, solutions used which then dried and these dry salts kind of locked the haptics in place. For our control lenses, we didn't see any rotation in either um, room temperature or body temperature. And so earlier I had mentioned that it was really important for us to document the serial numbers and we were able to do so in 12 out of the 13 cases. The reason why I say so is because um, there was this particular case in October of 2022 um, that we pulled from this uh, MOD database from the FDA and it provided a lot number. Um, the, the, the context for that case was very similar to that of our cases where we saw um, post-operative severe optic tilt after um, the Yamani technique and the CT Lucia 602 lenses. And so the serial number was actually very close to the cases um, five through 13, whereas in our cases one through four, the serial number was much newer or much uh, older. And so if these lenses are displaying severe optic tilt, why are we even using them in the Yamani technique? And the answer to that is that several studies show that this is the preferred IOL for the Yamani technique. Um, in recent literature, the 
the CT Lucia 602 lens showed significantly more force to break, but less force to avulse, meaning that this may reduce haptic breakage. Um, another study showed that the CT Lucia lens had the highest tensile strength, and it required the most um, dislocated force to in order to um, remove the flange haptic from the sclera. And this, all of this evidence shows that this is the preferred IOL for the Yamani technique. Um, unfortunately, there are no better alternative on the market right now. But I also wanted to document that there are, um, there have been studies not only here at Moran, but elsewhere, both at a single uh, academic center and at multiple academic centers. These authors concluded that what we're seeing, this severe optic tilt, this may be due to something called batch effect and that we only see it in um, a certain number of IOLs um, based on manufacturing. And so what is the solution if this is the best lens for the Yamani technique? Well, there have been uh, proposals that we could use a retinal endo laser to laser the haptic um, at the optic haptic junction in order to lock in and stabilize that position. Um, this would address any immediate haptic rotation upon IOL insertion or post-operative IOL tilt. Um, there are no clinical studies currently looking at this. And so in summary, this is a detailed pathological analysis of 13 CT Lucia 602 IOLs implanted in cases lacking capsular support. 12 out of the 13 cases were done during uh, via the Yamani technique and uh, one out of the 13 was done via iris fixation. The IOL serial numbers um, were able to be documented for 12 out of the 13 cases. We saw that in lenses explanted um, November of 2022 and onwards, there was earlier decentration and dislocation postoperatively. Uh, we saw something called a severe optic tilt. And when we assess experimentally, we saw that four of the haptics showed free rotation. There is speculation that this is also due to a lot and batch effect, but there has been no documented or published um, reports from Zeiss. I wanted to thank and acknowledge um, all of the surgeons involved, um, especially Dr. Nakatsuka. I wanted to thank my mentors, Dr. Werner and Dr. Mamelis, as well as the previous PATH fellows, Neil and Kevin. These are my references. Um, thank you for listening. I'd love to take any questions. Yeah, I switched to the AR40 almost exclusively, which has its own issues. And one of the big reasons actually that we were using the CT this is not just because of um, stability at the optic haptic junction, but more importantly, is because the haptics so much more flexible and easier to put into the needle. Mm -hmm. Is that taking? Yeah. Is that working well with the VR party? It is, yeah. So actually, there were just yesterday, I thought that I had created another rotisserie effect, but it turns out that um, all of the, just the two instances of what I thought was rotisserie was actually surgeon related issues. And um, it's not just our institution, but this has kind of gone on all over the place, right? It's rampant. and many people know that already. But after switching to the AR-40, many surgeons are switching now to the AR-40, and it takes a little more technical aspects to kind of figure that out at the end of the day, especially the trainees. Um, but we're seeing far, far less incidences of gross history than that, um, at least not like this. Thank you. Dr. Olson. So uh, curious to hear what Nick has to say as well, and very involved. But uh, so so this is the process known as staking, where when you have a three piece lens, you've got to stake those haptics and put them in place. Uh, it, it it is a tricky process; it always has been. Uh, and and uh, the, the staking is not something that you you can easily control exactly. You know how much, and uh, I know that. Uh, when I watched the overall process after the test, they would do is that uh, this was this was kind of done by hand because they they would insert it in and then they would kind of pull on it 
And if it pulled out easily, they'd have to stake it again or redo it. So that was a, I mean, that's a pretty non-sensitive test. And, and it, it's clearly related to something that's supposed to be, you know, placed inside of a bag or something where there's support all the way around it. Uh, if the staking <clears throat> obviously has a group or a batch in which they're not being quite as careful to support a different thing rather than it just coming out and they're rotating, then you could easily see that this would be a problem. Also remember, staking itself is very variable depending upon what the material, what everybody liked about this lens, was the material, as Austin just said, is much more malleable, deformable, movable, without being permanently crimped or change in its overall shape and parameter. So I think if, if we if we could get in, and it, it may be worth, I'm not quite sure how to do it, but this, the group here has been phenomenal, to look at the difference of how easily you can stake. And, and as I remember the lens you're using, I think it has PMMA haptics, doesn't it? And the, the air ported. Yeah, the air ported, right? Yeah. And so um, I have a feeling that it's it's easier to stake and get it permanently there than it is. I think them as polyvinyl brawl brawl them as another yeah. PVDF, yeah. Yeah. And so uh, I, I I'll bet you that you'll find that it's it's much much harder. Plus, as I remember, the haptics on the Air Forty are are a bit thicker, aren't they? Aren't they bigger than the? Yeah, that's an interesting thing. Yes, they are thicker than other PMMA have. I think that's a whole other discussion point. So, so the thicker the lens, it's actually it's actually a square function of the overall area in the lens is going to give you more overall, you know, uh, stability. And so for the same amount of effort, it's probably going to be about two times less likely to rotate. Oh, and probably four times more likely not to rotate just because of the size. So. The, these are all issues, and Yamani is obviously the physics as you're pulling it out, <laughs> stretching more, we're going to cause more rotational stress at that junction. Therefore, it has to be more resistant. Yeah, yeah, completely agree. Um, thank you for those comments. I think that it would be interesting to see if maybe somehow we could see how inserting the PVDF haptic into the lumen of the needle versus or staking versus if we inserted like so, a so PMA. Speaking, you, you'd have to get the, the company to give you lens and the haptics, yeah. stick it in yeah. and, and then see one versus the other. But I'm confident you'll find that <clears throat> it, it's harder to get that rotational uh, stability mm -hmm. in regards to the luteal lens. Yeah. Um, For purposes of time, go ahead. What he said. Wait. <laughs> I think Dr. Chaya had a comment online. Can you guys hear me? I'm unmuted now. Yes. Yeah, so, you know, aside from the rotisserie effect, I don't think the CT Lucia is a great lens for sulcus implantation unless you're going to do optic capture. So part of that is the design of the lens. If you look at it, there is a bevel on the edge, but it's actually still a square edge. So I spoke to Soon Pak Chi from Singapore because she's done a, a, a tremendous amount of the money technique lenses, and they are not using the CT Lucia. They don't feel it is the preferred lens, primarily because of the anterior optic edge being squared. Uh, so our AR40 and Z9003 are really our preferred lenses, are really the preferred lenses, and that's what they're using primarily in Singapore uh, because of the rounded anterior convex surface of the lens optic. Um, and the other thing is that Shin, when he first described this technique, Shin has access to a different type of lens in Japan that is not only a larger optic, I believe it's close to seven millimeters, it might be six and a half millimeter optic and 13 and a half or 14 millimeters from haptic to haptic distance. So it's a much larger lens. And I think that reduces the risk for, for chafing. And also it's just an easier lens, especially in particularly highly myopic eyes where um, there's a large span that you need to cover from sclera to sclera. So in, in fact, my own practice is that I don't think the Yamani is a suitable technique for patients that are high myopes because uh, there's a little bit too much stress, wh whether you're using C2 Lucia or an AR40 lens I don't think it's a suitable technique when you when you're stretching out the haptics that far in a large myopic eye. So my just arbitrary cutoff is if I have somebody that's uh, over 27 millimeters axial length, I'm just going to go to a standard scleral fixated lens of choice. 
and not do a Yamani technique. And the other thing is that for the CQWCA, I think for those of you that are still using the CQWCA, I think it's still a suitable lens in the bag. Um, but if you're going to be placing in the sulcus, you have to ensure that you have optic capture primarily because of the squared edge design. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Chai. Mm -hmm. All right, last but not least, we have Shweta, one of our other uh, Ocular Path Fellows. She uh, was raised in Georgia, and her fun fact is that she has been skydiving three times with a Groupon coupon, so very fiscally responsible. <laughs> Okay, so I don't recommend skimping on skydiving tickets because the first time I did it, it was after a rainstorm in Miami and we went through a cloud and landed in someone's backyard instead of the skydiving location. So we had to walkie talkie in and get rescued. But who can resist a good deal, you know? So I just want to talk to you today about my project, the variations in morphology and patency of Chang hydrodissection cannulas used in cataract surgery. So um, I just want to say quickly that I'm so lucky to be a part of this lab um, and have the incredible mentors in Dr. Mamlis and Dr. Werner and all the other uh, members of my team. The mentorship over the past few months have been awesome, and I'm excited for the rest of the year ahead. Here are financial disclosures. And then I'll also start off with a quick question. What do the following pictures have to do with the eye? And you can kind of think about what I'm hinting at in your head. So we have fish hooks, nails, a knife, and here's a little bit of a gruesome hint if it wasn't obvious. <laughs> so essentially this was just attention grabbing and we don't want them in the eye. And this is a macro representation of what I'm trying to um, de depict in our project microscopically. So we're taking a look at Chang cannulas used in hydro dissection. Um, and I just wanna note that the next few slides that we're taking a look at are all cannulas that were unopened and in their original packaging from the manufacturers. So um, these were unused, unadultered. This first cannula here is actually from the Moran, um, from the manufacturer MSI. And you can kind of see that unfinished, unpolished um, edge of the tip of the cannula. And then we also have here some poorly finished, unpolished surfaces. These also are two cannulas from the Moran with the unpolished tips. And then this one was most shocking to me was we had two streams. Um, and this was thankfully caught by the surgeon prior to use in hydrodissection, and he was able to replace it with um, a working cannula. So a little bit about the conception of this project. Dr. Jesse Chu, who was a former Mammalus Werner Path Fellow in 2004, 20 years ago, um, came to us and said that there was variability in the chain cannulas he was using. And his workflow is to always prime before use in hydrodissection. And he noticed that sometimes it was difficult to push through the stream of VSF. So he had a range from fully patent and not blocked to partially blocked um, with a weak stream and also completely blocked with no stream of VSS going through. So he sent us a bunch of cannulas and asked us to conduct a study and to make it more robust and formal, we added a few more cannulas from other manufacturers as well. So a little reminder, as I'm sure you all know, we use chain cannulas for hydrodissection. So we typically want an irrigator with that 90 degree bend to allow for irrigation both to the left and right with ease um, so that that fluid wave successfully um, separates the lens from the capsular bag. So you direct the tip end of the cannula 180 degrees away from the corneal incision, and you push through a continuous stream of BSF, which um, travels around the lens and through the and between the capsular bag. And you can see that the fluid wave pushes the lens forward in the bag. And then you engage the tip posteriorly um, and in the center and push the lens down. 
further breaking those cortex and capsular adhesions around the bag. So successful completion of this is when you can rotate the lens within the bag, um, ensuring that you completed your hydrodissection. And then chain cannulas can also be used for hydrodelineation. And I actually pulled these pictures from the Moran core, and I thought it was helpful to note that chain cannulas can be used in both. So the difference in hydrodelineation is that VSS is used to cleave the outer epinuclear shell from the central endonucleus, and that's how they are different. So looking at the cannulas that we studied in our project, these are um, from the Oasis Medical Catalog, and these are all the cannulas that they approve for hydrodissection. And we're taking a look at the chain cannula. Similarly, this is from the Anodyne Surgical Catalog, um, and these are all the cannulas they have approved for hydrodissection. And again, we're looking at the chain cannula. I couldn't find the MSI Surgical Catalog online, but here are broadly the three different cannulas we're using for our study. So Oasis, Anodyne, and MSI. And most, they're pretty similar. They have that 90, 90 degree bent tip with a beveled edge, and they're all 27 gauge. The only difference is Oasis is 19 millimeters in length, and the other two are 22 millimeters in length. So the purpose was to do a detailed lab assessment of the variability in morphology, um, which includes the shape of the opening port, as well as the surface finishing and the patency of these chain hydrodissection cannulas used in cataract surgery. So we had three different groups that our cannulas came from. The first one was the first 17 where Dr. Chu noticed this problem. So these were from the manufacturers Oasis and Anodyne. These were primed with BSS by him. And if deemed appropriate, they were eventually used in hydrodissection. If not appropriate, just placed back in, the, um, in its original packaging and sent to us. So when we received them, we placed them in two milliliter vials of distilled water, um, and for 24 hours and then let them dry for 24 hours so as to remove any of the salts from the BSS solution. We got a second set of cannulas also from Dr. Chu in Canada, also from Oasis and Anodyne. These were um, unused and in their original packaging as well. And then group three is also unused and from the Moran, from the third manufacturer, MSI. So in total, 34 cannulas with 17 that were originally primed and opened up, and then 17 that were not opened and not primed. So for all of these, we performed gross and light microscopy, and then we selected a portion of cannula, specifically six of them, to go undergo SEM and surface analysis. So 34 is a small sample size, and it's um, hard to do meaningful statistics on this, but we can look at this data broadly and see that there is variability. There's variability in not only the shape um, of the opening ports, but also um, some that were completely open, not blocked or partially blocked. Um, we had the differences in finishings with rust and irregular edges, as well as debris noted on some of the cannulas as well. And then also the fluid streams. We had a range from a normal stream to a partially blocked stream, weak and a um, no stream at all, and sometimes even that double stream. And then here is the second set of cannulas that were unopened, both from Canada and from the Moran, representing all three manufacturers. And again, a variability in the surface finishings and the openings of the port. And the fluid streams obtained here were mostly normal. There was a few that were um, weakened, but not as, um, not as striking as the first set. So in my case, a picture really does say a thousand words, um, and it couldn't be more true to understand the findings of this project. So these are both Oasis cannulas that were unopened in that second set. Um, first, we have the fully patent, and you can see that the opening is nice and clear, um, and then a partially blocked um, cannula with a weaker stream, and you can see kind of the pinched end. Here, also a partially blocked cannula, this time with residue um, noted at the opening. And this is an Oasis cannula that we used, um, or that Dr. Chu had used. And you can see that the even though both presented a weak stream, the last, the last slide as well as this one, the morphology and appearance is definitely very different. And then we have fully blocked cannulas, and you can see the differences in the residue present at each of the tips. These were all Oasis cannulas in that first set that were primed and used by um, and assessed by Dr. Chu, and then we removed the salts and confirmed all of his findings as well. 
Here are some of the irregular and sharp finishings and edges. Um, this, you see all these pictures represent the three different manufacturers. So we have MSI, Anodyne, and Oasis over here. Um, this one, this one, and this one are all from the Moran. So that was interesting to note. And then again, that abnormal double stream, which was noted by Dr. Chu, confirmed by us. This is an Oasis cannula. And when we um, took a high mag photo, you can see that second lateral port opening. So then we did scanning electron microscopy coupled with energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy, so EDS. And we placed these cannulas uncoated and mounted um, on a support. And they were analyzed with high vacuum and an accelerating voltage of 15 to 20 kilovolts. Um, and you can see how they're mounted right here. And then we um, further used EDS to um, understand the elemental composition of the cannulas. And we focused our analysis on the tip ends of each of the cannulas. So here's our first SEM um, of an Oasis cannula. The first is a standard SEM photo where you can take a closer look at the finishing. The second is a backscattered photo where the white um, spot two is a heavier elemental composition and spot one is usually some debris or deposit that we wanted to focus in on and determine its elemental composition. So cannulas are typically stainless steel, which is an iron alloy. So you see the representation of iron, chromium, and nickel, which is which are all typically found in stainless steel. And then spot one, that black area is um, represented here, and you can see carbon. So maybe points to an organic compound, and we hypothesize this could be potentially related to part of the manufacturing process, but unclear. Another Oasis cannula, um, similar elemental compositions you'll see in all six that we did SEM on, um, but you can take a note of different surface finishings. Here's an anodyne cannula, um, same carbon in the black spot and the stainless steel composition elsewhere. Another anodyne cannula with pretty striking surface finishing. Here an MSI cannula from the Moran, same elemental composition and same here too, with a different surface finishing noted here. So why does all of this matter? So cannula related complications do occur and they are reported in the literature. Most commonly they're, a, they're due to these dislodged or flying cannulas. And it's when the lure lock syringe um, or the lure lock mechanism between the syringe and the disposable cannula disengages. And this is typically when um, surgeons perform stromal hydration of the incision. And this has less than a tenth of a percent of incidence, but it results in um, some important things like corneal perforation, hyphema, iris laceration, retinal damage, um, and a whole host of things. But more importantly for us, we only found one case report related to the complications of a poorly polished 27 gauge BET hydrodissection cannula, which is similar to what we're, what we're studying in the chain cannulas. Um, and it tore an intact capsular rexus. So from the anterior edge of the tear of the capsular rexus, it, all, it also um, extended all the way to the posterior capsule in that same area. And when they analyzed this grossly, just rubbing the tip of their finger over the end of the cannula, they were able to feel that rough margin. And that was also confirmed on a high mag photo as well. And then funnily enough, in 2021, the FDA recalled the anodyne surgical chain cannulas, which is one of the ones that we studied. Um, due to the product having a yellowish brown and greenish brown residue um, present at the tip of the cannula, which is exactly what we had noted as well. So you might think, oh no, we've unlocked a new fear, a new complication of cataract surgery that we need to be cognizant of. But I just want to ensure that although we were surprised by the findings of this study, the complication rates are rare and rarely reported in literature. But it's important though, to always have good quality control measures of any instruments that we use in cataract surgery. So in summary, we were surprised by the variability in morphology and patency of these disposable cannulas. Um, the findings raised concern about potential damage to the capsule during hydrodissection due to those irregularities or debris in the cannula. Um, the debris and residue could cause tasks. And I was in preparation for this watching Kevin's presentation from last year. Um, and he was presenting on tasks and Dr. Olson said, we're only one stupid manufacturer's mistake away from a full onslaught of tasks. And I thought that tied in both of our projects really nicely <laughs> together. So 
Although cannula-related complications are rare, the most common ones reported are those dislodged and flying cannulas. So the main takeaways that I want everyone to kind of understand is that for all the ophthalmologists and soon-to-be ophthalmologists in the room, prime, prime, prime before you use your cannulas in surgery to confirm appropriate fluid flow. Um, and then also, if there's any irregularity or sharp edges noted under the operating microscope, just throw it out, replace the cannula. And then it's important to always have good quality control of any of these instruments that we use in cataract surgery. I'd like to thank and acknowledge Dr. Mamlis and Dr. Werner and my awesome co-fellow, Melissa, and then Dr. Chu for initiating this um, investigation and telling us to look into this, because I thought it was a pretty neat thing um, and something that probably none of us were aware of before. Here are my references, and I would love to take any questions. <laughs> Dr. Mamelis. <laughs> I think we're always surprised when we look at something that's supposed to be highly polished and highly manufactured, and how it's not. And we ran into this most recently when you've got the polymer I8 kits. And they say, well, that can't cause any problems with the capsule, but there's a little metal piece inside of it that when we analyzed it turned out to be very poorly finished. So it actually did cause some capsular failure for supposedly. This device wasn't supposed to cause it. We go all the way back to our initial EMs of IOL. When IOLs were first coming out, it was interesting. We would do the EM of the Edgerman IOL, and then just for fun, when I was a fellow, many decades ago, we broke a Coca Cola bottle in half and did the EM of that, and we couldn't tell the difference between the IOL and the uh, broken Coca Cola bottle. So, Manufacturing has come a long way, polishing has come a long way, but when you've got the very small lumen cannula, polishing those and finishing those is very difficult. And so I think your, your recommendations are, are the best thing to do. Make sure you flush these soon that they flush up okay, and there's nothing clogged. And look at them real quick under the microscope. Just take a second before you go into the eye and use these. And that'll help to you know, eliminate some of the potential problems. Awesome. Thanks, Dr. Mamelis. Dr. Warner? Was surprising most things because if you remember the SM uh, analysis, all of the cannulas were open. They were removed from the packages and we analyzed them. All of them had a recipe. So there was an organic residue on top of the cannula that has a composition that's kind of steel. So, which residue is that? It's something related to manufacturing. We don't know what it is, but there is a residue. This was very surprising to me. And I mean, when you think about things that can cause cancer, could you be causing cancer if people are not trying before? We don't even know how to do it then. But I was extremely surprised that in each camera, camera removed from the package, there was a residue on top of it. You know, it's surprising what, what could happen. There's an outbreak of pass in Singapore that turned out that there was material left on the IOLs during the manufacturing again that wasn't removed and that can't cause the pass. So, unfortunately, I, I will be remembered as Mr. Pass. So, prevent pass would be a good thing. Um, Dr. Chai also mentioned it would be good to study and compare single use to reusable cannulas, which I think that's also, we can maybe do that in our labs, yeah. 